Ash. So thank you very much. So I guess we have to switch uh, on the panel. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, well, uh, my name is Edson Lionel from uh, Universidade de Estadual Paulista. I'm delighted to be here. I'd like to thank Paulo for, for the invitation uh, and also the all the organizers for this very nice meeting. So my second uh, uh, slide will be similar to what Professor Pereira uh, made this uh, morning, showing a plot of our uh, Brazilian mapping. So we have seen here, we can see the border of Brazil. Here is uh, Rio Grande do Norte, Natal is just around here. And this is Sao Paulo, the state. And Rio Claro, uh, well Sao Paulo, the capital is here. And Rio Claro is about 160 kilometers far in the north of Sao Paulo, crossing in Campinas in, in the middle of Sao Carlos and Campinas. So uh, I have two goals in this talk. The first one is discuss some statistical properties for two-dimensional mappings. I will address two systems. One is uh, dissipative and the other one is uh, conservative. And, and then I will give you some arguments, uh, the scaling formalism observed for this uh, first part can be extended to time-dependent billiards. Then uh, in Professor Family talk this morning, I was uh, w when he talked about uh, film films, and scaling properties observed in film films. I was remembering the first contact I had with uh, this type of scalings. It was about in 2002 when I was in Belo Horizonte doing my PhD in statistical mechanics laboratory. There was a friend of mine who is now a professor in Viçosa. His name is Ismael Lima, supervised by José Guilherme. I guess he's retired now, no, not sure. Anyway, uh, and then Ismael was uh, analyzing his time series for, he was analyzing profiles of ripped paper. And then he was uh, plotting many different time series for this uh, scaling systems. And his uh, series were very similar to my series in chaotic systems. So I, I decided to try his formalism to be applied in chaotic system. And then s the first observation was in 2004, I mean, was a publication in an extremely simple system, which is so-called fermi ulan model. Ulan, as Stan Ulan was mentioned this morning by Professor Landau. So the system is indeed a particle confined inside of two rigid walls. One of them is periodically movi moving in time, and the other one is fixed, uh, working as a returning mechanism for this particle to collide again with this moving wall. The moving wall was then uh, a device who transfer energy to the moving particle. There is then an amplitude of motion, this epsilon tilde. There is a frequency of oscillation, which is turned out to be irrelevant in the dynamics because we can just raise scale the time, call this as T prime. And, and there is a distance from the equilibrium position from the fixed wall to this uh, moving wall. Then this epsilon tilde could be uh, divided by this L, giving a dimensionless parameter. And this dimension, dimensionless parameter is the only one and relevant counterparameter of the system. So if we look at the average velocity for, the, for a chaotic orbit moving inside of this uh, system here, it giving an initial velocity very low, very low as compared to the moving wall's velocity, the particle, the average velocity starts to grow with n. This is according to a power law, scaling with n, like a uh, random walk particle. Eventually, it passes from a crossover 
and approaches to a saturation. And if we start with an initial velocity which is not small enough, we see uh, an additional plateau, which I will uh, discuss later on, which is related to a break of symmetry of the distribution probability function. But it is also uh, a scaling invariant with respect to the parameter epsilon. And then if we rescale the axis properly, all of the curves are overlapped onto each other into a single and the universal plot. So this uh, result were published in 2004 in a collaboration with my supervisor, Jefferson Silva, which I have the pleasure to visit him this year. And uh, I was indeed in, in, in England in the beginning of my postdoc, then uh, McClintock also signed the paper. Then after this seminal publication, I came back to Brazil and uh, founded my group, and my group then uh, founded many uh, applications of this scaling, and we published many other different results. So, uh, the thing I want to talk today is related to this most gen generic Hamiltonian system, which is separated in two parts. One is this uh, age naught. Age naught is an integrable part. And then there is an age one corresponding to a non-integrable part, which is controlled by this parameter epsilon. So if epsilon equals to zero, we have an integrable system. If epsilon is different from zero, we have a transition from integrability to non-integrability. And this is the transition I want to discuss using this uh, scaling formalism. We see here this Hamiltonian depends on two pairs of canonical variables. I1, theta1, I2, theta2. But because it is time independent, we can eliminate one of these four vi variables. So for example, I2. And then we end up with a flow of three dynamical variables. If by any chance we intercept this flow of solutions by a plane in theta two constant, we get a Poincare session for the dynamical variables I1, theta one in discrete interceptions. And a sequence of these pairs, I1, theta one, are mostly described by this generic mapping here. So we have uh, three functions to be chosen according to our interest. This function H, this function K, and this function P. We have also uh, the presence of this parameter here, also this, uh, describing the transition from integrability to non-integrability. H, K, and P are nonlinear function of their variables, any of variable we want to choose. But because uh, this is, because the mapping comes from a Hamiltonian, it must preserve the area of the phase space. And the error preservation is observed only when this condition is satisfied. So we can choose any functions we want, but they must fulfill this condition. Right? Then, uh, the two choices I will do in this seminar are presented here. First, I will fix age as a function sine. It's a periodically function, infinitely uh, derivative, continuous, and so on. Smooth enough. I will choose this p equals to zero to eliminate this parameter epsilon from the second equation. And then I will play with two different expressions of k. One is given by 1 over i n plus 1 to a power of gamma. This gamma is no negative number. And the other one is a linear function of i n plus 1. So if we see here, for uh, we start with this case first. So if we see here the mapping with this special k, uh, it is extremely simple and reminds the so-called shrikov taylor mapping. The parameter epsilon is here. If epsilon is zero, we have an integrable mapping. 
if epsilon is different from zero, we have a non-integrable mapping. For non-integrable case, the phase space of this mapping looks more like these figures plotted here. There is already a result from Chirikov criteria that's saying that for any epsilon larger than this 0 0.9716 and so on, these uh, invariant spanning curves, also called invariant tori, are destroyed. And the destruction of these curves allow a chaotic dynamics to diffuse, diffuse unbounded in the phase space. So for epsilon 0 0.5, we see a very big island in the middle, the regular dynamic inside. We have many invariant spanning curves even above or below of the, the, this, the island. For epsilon 0 0.9, we see here a chaotic sea. This chaotic sea cannot penetrate the islands or even cross the invariant spanning curve because of the error preservation. And this is very close to the transition. We, uh, the, the invariant spanning curves are here, but difficult to be obtained. And for any larger epsilon than 0 0.9716, we see unbounded orbits. There is some rigorous result based on Green's criteria, something like this. But uh, using um, overlap of resonances, it is possible to prove this. There is a result from Lichtenberg and Lieberman on, on, on the classical regular and chaotic dynamics book uh, discussing this, uh, ho how they get to this uh, point. Yes, exactly. Yes. Thank you very much. One of them are related to the destruction of the most, which is called the most, uh, most um, uh, irrational tori. So it came from Kent theory. Well, then uh, I will choose first uh, parameter epsilon larger than this because I want to investigate a particular transition. A transition from unbounded diffusion to bounded diffusion. How can we, we do this? So uh, we can do this by introduction of dissipation. So I will add dissipation to this uh, dynamical variable i, which is some, some whole action. And uh, if gamma is zero, we have a conservative case. If gamma is different from zero, we have a dissipative case. Then this is the determinant of the Jacobian matrix. If gamma is different from zero, this determinant is smaller than one. And uh, from Liouville's theorem, it is proved that there is area contraction on the phase space. And if you have area contraction in the phase space, there are attractors. Given these attractors are from, from the infinity, uh, it's just a matter of time. The average action will approach to a saturation regime. So the diffusion, un the unbounded diffusion, is uh, interrupted by the presence of dissipation. So this is a plot for a relative large parameter epsilon and a small gamma. So dissipation is from the order of 10 to the minus 2. We see here a chaotic orbit. If we measure Lyapunov exponent, the Lyapunov exponent for this orbit is positive. Then we have chaos. But this chaos is a dissipative one because if we do the summation of the positive Lyapunov exponent and with the negative Lyapunov exponent, the, sum the summation is negative and smaller than zero, proving the uh, dissipation. So uh, what type of uh, observable we want to measure? We want to measure the root mean square action, which is defined from two averages. One. This one is an average over the orbit, 
we start an initial condition and evolve the dynamics in time, measuring the uh, average in time. And the second one, this one, is an average over an ensemble of initial conditions. Typically, because the mapping is two-dimensional, we average uh, in, the, in the variable theta. So, and then here is a plot of e root mean square against n for different combinations of control parameters. We have here a set of two values of epsilon, 10 to the 2 and 10 to the 3rd, and a set of three different values of gamma. The curves can be described in the following, year, in the following way. They start to grow for a short time for an initial action I not very small as compared to epsilon, and then eventually they bend towards a saturation after pacing from a crossover. This slope of growth here is uh, 0.5, and these curves here are quite similar to the curves observed for uh, film, uh, thin films deposition. So. We can propose three scaling hypotheses, very similar to the scaling observed in thin films. The first one describes the regime of growth. So for, sh for short time, short n, e root mean square grows with a power of beta. And beta is 0 0.5. For very large n, typically giving the saturation, we have E root mean square behaving as epsilon to a power of 1 and gamma to a power of alpha 2. This alpha 1 and 2 are so-called critical exponents. And finally, this crossover uh, iteration number marking the changeover from growth to the saturation scale with epsilon to a power of z1, gamma to a power of z2. These three scaling hypotheses can be written in terms of an homogeneous function. And this homogeneous function ends up with two very beautiful scaling laws relating the critical exponents. These results were firstly ob obtained in a master dissertation from Caio, my student in, in Rio Claro. Unfortunately, Caio got ill after the defense and never came back to finish to finalize the paper. But the exponents alpha 1, you see it here, from the scaling hypothesis, if we plot the saturation against epsilon and the saturation against gamma, we, we obtain the exponents alpha 1 and alpha 2. So alpha 1 is about 1, and alpha 2 is just about minus 0 0.5. And the same can be made to the crossover. So we can measure this crossover and plot the crossover against epsilon and against gamma. And here are the uh, results. The crossover against epsilon giving uh, z uh, up from the order of 0 and z z1 and z2 is minus 1. Uh, if we transform this, uh, so here is a summary of the critical exponents, and, and we've if we do the proper scaling transformations, all of these curves are overlapped onto a single enhanced universal plot, then confirming the scaling invariance with respect to either epsilon and either gamma. Right? So I think this ends the first part of uh, the talk, and then let us move on to the second one, which gives a second choice for k. So in this case, the transition we want to investigate is a transition from integrability to no integrability, to no integrability, different from the first part, where we want to address to the transition from limited to unlimited diffusion. I want you to look at this term here. And this is a typical phase space, capital I against theta. We have a large, relatively large chaotic C. And this chaotic C is confined by invariant spanning curves. So a chaotic particle cannot cross the invariant spanning curve, neither up or down, right? Yeah. 
yes, thank you very much for your question. But, but uh, no, no. The first, the first choice was k is i n plus 1. So in the numerator, in this condition, gives uh, unlimited diffusion by nature. Now, we, we changed uh, the k. This is the second k. So it is written in this form. So if we look at for the behavior of this ratio, 1 over i n plus 1, remember that gamma is a non-negative uh, parameter. It can be 1, 2, half, and something like this. But for any very small capital I, the ratio becomes large. If the ratio becomes large, because this sum is modulated to pi, theta n plus 1 becomes uncorrelated to theta n for a small i. And this uncorrelation produces a type of a random number for this sign for this function sin, sign. And then, and then uh, because this is a, a random number, it's a stochastic number, let's say in this sense, the dynamical variable i diffuses. But you see that as soon as capital I grows, the ratio 1 over i uh, becomes finite. So it is no longer large enough. So if this is a small number, this ratio brings correlation to the theta n plus 1, this behaves well, and then the, the diffusion in the capital variable i stops. So for large i, we have the invariant spanning curves. So we want to investigate the behavior of this chaotic C here. So here I plot a phase space for different parameters just to evidence the localization of the invariant spanning curves. This is 10 to the minus 2. Invariant spanning curves are localized in somehow symmetric way near 0 0.1. And for epsilon 10 to the minus 3, it is about 0 0.33 or something like this. So if we look at the average the root mean square action defined in a similar way as in the first case. Typical behavior is plotted this way. The I root mean square starts to grow with an N, and then eventually it bases from a crossover and saturates. There is an ad hoc transformation here, which appears mathematically uh, in a very soon. So the three scaling hypotheses are written this way. This first part describes the regime of growth. This part describes the saturation, and this gives the crossover. And using the same formulas as from the scaling function, homogeneous function, we end up with this uh, scaling law. And for different gammas, as for example, 1, we obtain a 0 0.5. This result here is equivalent to the first result observed in Physical Review Letters 2004, I showed it before, for the Fermi-Ulan model. And then gives us gamma uh, z minus 1. For gamma 2, this is from the order of one third, and this, the exponent z is from the order of minus 4 over 3. And using this scaling law with this uh, appropriate uh, scaling transformations, all of the curves overlap onto each other into a single and hence universal plot. Then, uh, all of these results were somehow uh, numerical. There is no rigorous on the investigation of these results. So we, we, we discussed it. Can we do any more, let's say, rigorous investigation on this, on this procedure? So the first uh, investigation is the characterization of the exponent beta. So if you remember, the first scaling hypothesis suppose that E root mean square scale with n epsilon squared to a power of beta. 
So this is the first investigation we want to. I will just replace this alpha to a proportional. How can we do this? If we look at the first equation of the mapping, and if we square the first equation, we end up with this expression here. But the average we made to ob obtain i root mean square considered two different averages, one over the orbit and the other one over the ensemble of different initial conditions. So if we, if we take an average over theta, we eliminate this first term here, and this term ends up with uh, 1 over 2. Then we get this very simple equation here. There is a very trick transformation we can do here. So if this term is settled on the left-hand side, we end up with an expression which is very similar to the derivative. So if we consider the regime of large n and very small epsilon, this expression here can be considered an approximation of the derivative. And then this recurrency equation was transformed in a, a differential equation. And this differential equation can be integrated very simple. And then we end up with i root mean square scaling with i naught plus epsilon squared over 2 n. If this term here is small, i root mean square scales with epsilon squared n over 2. If we, if we look at this expression here and compare with the first scaling hypothesis, there is an analytical approximation for beta, a half. This is the confirmation of the random walk diffusion. So if you say, well, I'm not enjoying this transformation. You are transforming a difference equation into a differential equation. So we can obtain the same result, not doing the transformation, but just by composition. So if we look here to this expression, it depends on n plus 1 on the left-hand side and n on the right-hand side. If we start with n equals to 0, then we end up with i squared 1 equals to i squared 0 plus epsilon squared over 2, this term here. If we compose again, replace the expression of y i1 obtained here, we end up with a scaling 2 from the i2. If we do for, for i3, we end up with 3. If we do for r i n, then we end up with this expression here here should be just n, not n plus 1. Then it's just a matter of take the root square, root mean square. Then this uh, exponent beta is present. The second exponent I want to discuss is the exponent alpha. Exponent alpha was obtained from my set x scale with epsilon to a power of alpha. How can we do this? From uh, Shirikov ta and Taylor map, there is this uh, 0 0.9716 parameter, which describes a very specific transition, a transition from local to global chaos. Local chaos implies that there is invariant spanning curve in the phase space, limiting the uh, unbounded diffusion. If the k is larger than 0 0.9716, all of the invariant spanning curves are destroyed, and then we have so-called global chaos. So if we look at the phase space we have here in our case, this transition can also be observed in our case because above of the invariant spanning curves, we may have chaos, but local. Below, we can have chaos. And this chaos here is confined by first invariant spanning curve from the positive side and first invariant spanning curve from the negative side. This is a transition from local above, from global below. And then what we can do is rewrite our equations of the mapping into the way they can, com can be compared 
to the Shirikov Taylor mapping. So our equations can be expanded in Taylor series to describe locally the dynamics of the invariant spanning curve. The first approximation is suppose that near this invariant spanning curve, the dynamics can be described by E tilde, which is a typical value of the invariant spanning curve, and a small perturbation. So this expression ends up with this approximation to the first equation, and, with, and if, if we write the equation for the dynamical variable theta in this way, this is an expression for i n plus 1. We uh, write it in a convenient way to apply Taylor expansion. We, we expand, get the first order, and isolate E tilde. We end up with E tilde scaling with an expression of this type here. And if, if E tilde scales with epsilon to a power of 1 over gamma plus 1, E sat, I sat, should scale with a constant of this expression here. Then, this is uh, first uh, expression for, first approximation for the parameter for the critical exponent alpha. If we know this uh, expression here and match this expression with the regime of growth, we, we have an approximation for the exponent z. Third exponent is written this way. Crossover should scale with epsilon to a power of z. These are the three scaling hypotheses, and this is the and first approximation for this uh, scaling exponent, critical exponent. These results were published in 2015. So uh, all the results I show you were obtained for an initial action very small, very small as compared to the counterparameter epsilon. So you can ask, what happens to the curves of I root mean square if you start with a different initial action, typically larger than the parameter, but at the same time is smaller than the saturation. If we start with an initial condition of this type, we observed an additional plateau, and this additional plateau, which is an NX, let's say, prime, it scales with epsilon squared over is, uh, epsilon squared over V0 squared. And we, if we uh, choose the initial conditions conveniently and do the transformation, the scaling transformation, all of these curves are overla overlapped onto each other into a single and universal plot. The question is also related to what explains these plateaus? What are the reasons of the plateaus? So, if we give an initial condition, this is n, number of interactions, and this is e root mean square. If we start with a very, very low initial action, all the curves start to grow together. And this is uh, an exponent from the order of a half. If we start with an initial condition here, part of the ensemble grows and part of the ensemble decreases. But there is a limitation for the i root mean square. i root mean square cannot assume negative numbers. Then as soon as this probability distribution of this i root mean square is broken by the lower limit of the i root mean square, this series starts to grow. Then if we look at the probability distribution obtained from analytical solution of the diffusion equation, so P is the probability of observing a given action, giving action root mean square at a given instant of time n. 
scale, uh, it has a behavior like this. For a short number of interactions, typically 10, we see a Gaussian very sharp. Then for as soon as we increase the number of interactions, the Gaussian enlarges. Eventually, for n equals to 40, the symmetry of the probability distribution function is destroyed. As soon as this left-hand side touches the vertical axis, the symmetry is, is broken. And this break of symmetry gives, explains the first plateau. Okay. So this is uh, the diffusion equation, a short observation, short comment on the diffusion equation. If we plot the diffusion equation against age, who is age? Age is a distance measured from the zero, from, from the zero action, in the positive side, uh, moving towards the first invariant spanning curve. So we see that this uh, diffusion coefficient stays constant for a long for a while eventually we have a change uh, and this change happens at the moment a dynamical particle reaches the first island when the particle reaches the island there is a phenomenon called stickiness it is a dynamical process which traps the particle for a while near this uh, island and this trapping uh, changes the diffusion coefficient and eventually it also changes the diffusion itself from normal diffusion to uh, many cases called as anomalous diffusion. Uh, another interesting result supporting this uh, stickiness is what we called survival probability. If we give an initial condition in the chaotic sea, it can diffuse either in a positive side, a negative side from the action. And uh, uh, as soon as it reaches the position of the first island, an exponential decay is changed to a power law decay. This power law decay is a signature of the stickiness. So at this point, from this point on beyond, we have uh, dynamical trapping. And this uh, normal diffusion is modificated, or can be modificated to anomalous diffusion. Results were published in, in uh, chaos. Given I have some uh, time, I want to discuss a little bit more on this uh, diffusion equation. There is a very specific range for the dynamical variable I to be used in this diffusion equation. I can should be limited to minus I FISC. FISC is uh, an acronym for first invariant spanning curve. So the yes. And the spun is uh, one is from negative side, positive side. And there is a boundary condition. It's uh, derivative of P with respect to i evaluated on this uh, invariant spanning curve should be zero. This condition implies we have no, we does not have, we don't have a flu of particles uh, through the invariant spanning curve. And the initial condition at n equals to zero should be localized in, in i naught. Well, there are many different techniques to solve this diffusion equation and uh, we have made, for example, separation of variables. We use the technique of separation of variables and we solved the problem and we found this uh, probability. Although this result is very well known and are uh, presented in many statistical mechanics books. And once we know the probability distribution, we can obtain I squared, which is integration of minus I fisk to I fisk, I squared, pi di and this integration gives us this result here and from this result we defined e root mean square and this e root mean square has this very nice expression here so can we somehow compare 
these results to the numerical simulations? The answer is yes. Uh, symbols describe simulation. Here we have considered an ensemble average of 5,000 different initial conditions. This number of initial conditions produce error bars which are smaller than the symbol. This is the reason of they are not shown here. And the continuous line gives the analytical results. So we obtain it from the diffusion equation. So we see the agreement between numerical simulation and theory is remarkable. Uh, what more can be done from the solution of the diffusion equation? It would be nice if by any chance we could obtain the exponent beta, alpha, and z. So if we get this expression here, consider only the relevant term, the, the most relevant term in this summation of k, which came from the boundary condition. Uh, if we do a Taylor expansion for short n for the dominant term of k, we end up with this expression here. When uh, this term here is, is small, the dominant term is epsilon squared n over 2, then we end up with this exponent beta is a half, is this is square root. For, uh, to obtain the crossover, this crossover here, we intercept the regime of growth with the saturation, and then we end up with this exponent here, epsilon 2 minus 2 gamma over 1 plus gamma, which is this z obtained here, analytically from the solution of the diffusion equation. And from any different i naught from 0, relative large i naught, uh, the overlap of the curves for large i naught are also in, in good agreement with this numerical and uh, theoretical. So these results here uh, were submitted to the uh, Journal of Statistical Physics. They passed it from the first review process. The referees sent the comments, and uh, one, them one of them accepted. The second one asked for a small discussion, short discussion on stickiness. And then we have to introduce this dis discussion on stickiness to resubmit the paper. And then to uh, conclude my uh, seminar, I will just give a glance to what could happen to billiards. So I show here a plot of a closed boundary, but this boundary is moving in time. Uh, this I chosen to, to show this figure here uh, in the seminar because it preserves the shape not the area of the, the billiard, but it preserves the shape. So this uh, shape preservation is sometimes called as brief, the breathing case. So the shape, the, the border, is given by this expression here in polar coordinates. It's one plus a perturbation of the circle, perturbation in time, and then plus epsilon cosine p theta, which gives the oval shape and a perturbation on the oval shape in time. There is a result from a team of uh, Russia. It's called the LRA conjecture. It's Loskotov, Ryabov, Akinshin conjecture. They claim that if you, if you have chaos in the dynamics of a billiard with a static boundary, this chaos is sufficient condition to observe unlimited diffusion in velocity if you introduce a time perturbation to the boundary. Unlimited diffusion is uh, also called Fermi acceleration. Right? And then for this case, if we plot average velocity against n, we see a slope here from the order of 0 0.65. This was numerical. 
there should be an error of not uh, shown in the figure. But there is uh, a group from uh, Slovenia, from the team of Marko Robinik, who proved these exponents analytically. This is for the non-breathing case, where eta 1 is different from eta 2. And this is slope from the order of 0 0.15. They proved, which is uh, the case of, of the breathing case, they proved it to be uh, 1 over 6. And 1 over 6 is 0 0.16. So this was... Uh, a, a billiard can be described by discrete maps. So because you, dis you describe the dynamics, all the time the particle collides with the border. Yes. Yes, it is. And then, uh, well, again, these plateaus here w can be explained by a break of symmetry. was a result observed in chaos 2009. Okay, then uh, my conclusions, just in time. Uh, for the dissipative case, we have a set of five critical exponents. Beta, alpha 1, alpha 2, Z1, Z2, and two scaling laws. So if we use these scaling laws with these numerical results, uh, the scaling law is fulfilled. This is for the dissipative case. And for the conservative case, we have only one scaling law with a set of three critical exponents. And uh, it, these exponents give, they give uh, the dis description of the average property, properties near a transition from integrability to non-integrability. And a break of symmetry can be explained by uh, as a new time scaling from uh, the solution of the diffusion equation. And we can also generalize these results to billiards, even if they are time dependent. So thank you very much indeed.